teste. Eu, tá meio baixinho, mas ele. É, ele fica tipo assim, ó. Tá bem alto, ó. Né? Porque deve ter um microfone direcional apontando aqui. Tá? tá aí, se ele não quiser também, aí pode apontar o direcional.
será? No, oh, that's fine. Yeah, that's okay. Perfect. Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, you can. Ah. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, it is <laughs> perfect. Okay. Yes, no problem. Problem, no problem. I like the sound of beards. Oh, the sound of birds. Será que liga a luz? A presentación. But now it's it's there, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it's working. Wow. I'm an analog person, so I like the the real laser, the photons striking the screen directly rather than this. But should work anyway. So. You can go with your finger. Oh, I can always use the finger, of course. Yes. <laughs> yeah, probably will. I will do that <laughs> if I get a little bit uh, un uncomfortable. But Rain. yeah, now the important things are the uh, keystrokes to go move forward and backwards. Yes. Okay, Richard, you you can whenever you say.
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another seminar of our cycle of seminars of the astronomy department here at the IAG. Today, we have the pleasure of having with us Professor Ricardo Di Marco. Many thanks for being here today with us presenting your work. Let me just briefly introduce uh, Ricardo. He obtained his PhD in astrophysics from the University Denis Diderot in France. And he got several research positions at universities in the USA. And currently, he's a full professor at the Universidad de Concepción in Chile. And he's also an asso associate researcher at the Cata Center. Ricardo is an active member of a number of international collaborations. And his research, research is focused in the study of galaxies, cluster of galaxies, and large scale structures in the universe in the context of galaxy formation and evolution. So as always, the questions can be, can be done after the presentation. If you are in YouTube, you can write down your question and we will read it for you. And well, if you are in the Google Meet, as always, you can just raise your digital hand there and, and ask your question. So whenever you're ready. Thank you very much for the introduction. You're welcome. Uh, well, I'm so happy to be here. And I first I need to thank Claudia this for inviting me it's been uh, many years uh, wishing to come here and finally I'm with you so thank you for being here today I will try to summarize what I've been doing and uh, during my research of clusters of galaxies during the last decade although I have already like 20 years working with this I have see some very familiar faces from my days when I was little a PhD student uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Excuse so me, uh, Ricardo. Yes. Sorry, very sorry. We had a technical issue. Okay. So we used to broadcast on YouTube. It failed the broadcast now. Uh, we will ask you, you will repeat the presentation. <laughs> uh, ah, okay, sure. Go ahead. YouTube for people to YouTube to okay. be able to follow your okay. presentation. Okay. Very okay. sorry. Good. That's okay. Sorry. Should I start then? You're going to repeat the introduction, right? Yes. Yes. So okay. We'll miss the. Oh, okay. Good. Yes. I will not repeat what I just said. So I'm just going to move straight to the science because of time. Time constraints, I guess. But it's nice to see Gastel there. Hello. 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 <laughs> so, so, so sorry, Ricardo. It's okay. No start problem. Again. No problem. Okay, <laughs> good afternoon everyone. Welcome to another seminar of our cycle of seminars of the astronomy department here at the IAG. Today we have the pleasure of having with us Professor uh, Ricardo Di Marco. Many thanks for being here with us today, presenting your work. Let me just briefly <laughs> introduce Ricardo, who obtained his PhD in astrophysics from the University Denis Diderot in France. And he got several researcher positions at, the universi at universities in the USA. Currently, Ricardo is a full professor at the Universidad de Concepción in Chile, and he's also an associate researcher at the Cata Center. Ricardo is an active member of a number of international collaborations, and his research is focused on the study of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and large-scale structures in the universe in the context of galaxy formation and evolution. So you can ask your questions as always after the presentation. If you have a question and you are in YouTube, you can write your question down in the chat and we will ask the question for you. And if you are in the Google Meet, you can raise your hand and directly ask the question. So Ricardo, whenever you're ready, you can start. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, I'm gonna try to summarize what I've been doing uh, the subject of clusters of galaxies during the last uh, decade, although I've been working on this for like about 20 years. So today I want to show some work done ma mainly by students and postdocs of some collaborations uh, that I will introduce to you in the presentation. 
but focusing on trying to understand, of course, the evolution of galaxies and the, this evolution in connection with their local environment, which is very important. Yeah? Galaxies are not isolated, and we need to understand how they evolve, taking into account the right context. So this talk is about that. But first, I would like to uh, briefly, this is an ad of my group in Concepcion in Chile, a uh, group of um, professors, uh, some associate researchers there. We have Claudia here, uh, who is uh, co-advising one of my uh, master students uh, working on clusters of galaxies using S-plus data. And uh, a number of people here, uh, there, Pierluigi Cerullo, who's one of my most active collaborators in, in Concepcion. And this, I started this group uh, more than a decade ago with, uh, with Julie Nante, now a professor at UNAP, and over the years has been growing. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, talking uh, about the science, and the science I'm interested in has to do with the quenching of the star formation in galaxies. And why quenching? That's important. Understand why quenching. Because quenching is necessary. Uh, here we, I show you the, this famous uh, Madao plot uh, that shows in the vertical axis the star formation rate density of the universe versus uh, redshift or look back time or cosmic time. So there you see that there is an, an evolution in the way the universe is forming stars in, in different environments. Here we don't specify exactly the, the type of environment, but galaxies in general, these results mostly they come from field studies. But you see that as, as you expect at the beginning of the universe, the galaxies start forming as stars to start to assemble the stellar mass content. And this activity of a star formation reaches a peak around redshift 2. That's what is called cosmic noon. But if you move on in, in cosmic time from the Big Bang, then you see that there is a decline in the star formation rate density of the universe. So it means that there are processes that affect the star formation rate in the universe, making this to decline, to decrease in time. Uh, theoretically, uh, the question, I mean, you can, you can try to, um, this is, I'm gonna, not gonna go into the, uh, the exact details here. Let's see if this works. Okay. Uh, you can, you can theoretically just do some back of the envelope calculations to start to reproduce the, uh, star formation rate density of the universe, the observed star formation rate density of the universe, which is this curve in black that you can see there. Um, and if you really want to reproduce that star formation rate density as a function of time, you do need quenching. You need to consider the fact that uh, galaxies, at some point, for several mechanisms, they stop forming as stars. Otherwise, if you don't consider quenching, you're going to have the star formation rate density to follow this red curve, which means that it diverges very quickly, very early on in the history of the universe. So you do need quenching if you want to explain the observations. In the local universe, you can see there the, um, the, the, uh, the, this very well-known plot where you have in the vertical axis the star formation rate of galaxies the horizontal axis, the stellar mass of the galaxies, which is basically star formation rate, tells us the, uh, the number of stars that are being formed in a galaxy. While the stellar mass gives you the number of existing stars in a galaxy. And if you do that, and you plot galaxies there, uh, at least in the local universe from Sloan data, we see that there is this feature uh, where uh, most of the star-forming galaxies are located, that is called the, the, the main sequence of star formation, the main sequence of star-forming galaxies. 
if you go above the main sequence, you have the, the, the more powerful uh, systems that are that we call starburst galaxies. Uh, you can see sort of they're kind of here in this in this part of the diagram. These are data, by the way. This is these are actual data. And uh, but you see galaxies here on this area of the diagram below the main sequence of the star formation for galaxies. Uh, in particular. There are galaxies that are down here, which we call red and dead galaxies. They are, if you do a color magnitude diagram of galaxies, you're going to see those galaxies in what we call the red sequence. In this uh, star formation rate versus stellar mass plot, they're down there. And basically, those galaxies have, uh, have, have had their star formation quenched. They have stopped forming stars, or they're forming very little uh, amount of stars. So this cartoon actually uh, summarizes, uh, I think, this sort of in a hand wavy way, if you like, the, the evolution of galaxies, where you have uh, it's the same plot, star formation rate versus stellar mass. You identify there with the, the, the line of a, a constant specific star formation rate. Uh, and then you're going to have galaxies evolving, yeah, moving up in the diagram as they, uh, the you find objects that are, are basically uh, increasing their star formation rate. If they increase their star formation rate, they're also going to increase their stellar mass content. So you would expect galaxies uh, as they build up uh, the st their, their stellar mass, they move up here in the diagram. But at some point, something happens to them. And I'm not going to say exactly what because we're still trying to figure that out. But something happens to them. These galaxies get transformed. And because of that transformation, the galaxies, they move down into this area of the diagram where they stop forming as stars, but they can still grow. They can still grow in stellar mass via processes that uh, do not involve the formation of new stars. For example, uh, uh, dry mergers. And this is what the problem that we call nature versus nurture is, right? So we don't know exactly if this transformation is due to the intrinsic properties of the galaxies, due to the initial conditions that formed them whether they are due to processes that occur inside the galaxies themselves, or they're actually, this transformation is actually triggered and driven by the environment, the place where those galaxies live in, right? And, and that's basically the, 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 uh, the main question that uh, I've been interested in in the last decade or so, right? Trying to understand how and where we go from galaxies that look like those, right? Look like those star forming galaxies with generous amounts of interstellar medium to galaxies that are like this object. You can see a little bit of uh, uh, interstellar medium, but in general, this, this galaxies, elliptical galaxies, they're no longer forming stars. So the question is how and where, right? Uh, how it could be in high density environments, environments of clusters, groups, protoclusters, filaments, right? Or maybe this transformation happens in the field, right? So there is the question of uh, the where is in, in what kind of halo, right? And, 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 and the how well points to the, the detailed process that is responsible for that. But also where we should probably uh, tie that to the when. And, and, and when we, we, we start thinking about the when exactly this happens, 
uh, then we are entering in the uh, in the um, in this uh, issue that is called pre-processing that galaxies they may actually be transformed even outside uh, the clusters so before they become part of uh, uh, large over density I give you some hints of processes that could be responsible for shutting down the star formation in galaxies. Uh, something related to uh, nature, we have, for example, uh, the consumption, the accelerated consumption of gas, right? Uh, after an initial burst of formation, that's what basically uh, studies of clusters for, for decades now have been showing that elliptical galaxies, they have this initial burst lasting about one giga year. And then after that, the galaxies, they consume all their gas and they become uh, this red and dead objects that evolve passively, right? So if you consume your gas uh, at, a, at a large rate, if your star formation rate is large enough, you might actually consume all your gas quickly and then you're not longer able to keep forming more stars. Uh, but if you heat up the gas, right, through uh, feedback processes such as AGN activity or supernovae winds, uh, a warm gas or a hot gas is unable to form stars. So you, your galaxy might actually have material to form more stars, but that material is not in the right physical condition to uh, produce this star formation. And, and that gas reheating could be due to nature, but also could be due to nurture. And uh, of course, this is most what I've been actually concerned with, is what happens to galaxy in high density environments by a galaxy uh, intracluster medium, intragroup medium interactions, or galaxy galaxy interactions, or any other type of interaction in this higher density environment. Uh, and this is basically nurture. So I, I give you those, those ideas of how this could happen. But I would like to show you this video that was kind of old. I mean, this was produced when I was a PhD student. Uh, uh, I don't know, to the year uh, 2002 or something that was shown at a meeting in Pasadena. I remember Simon White was showing this kind of simulation. This is done by uh, Volker Springer and his group. But I like it because it gives you uh, an idea of what's happening to dark matter and to baryons, the baryons that form the visible components of galaxies, what we can directly observe, right? Baryons are complicated. Bar it's difficult to, to model baryons. It's difficult to describe uh, baryonic physics because dark matter is simple. It's just gravity, basically. Dark matter, they, don't, uh, they are collisionless particles, right? But baryons are not. So you need, to, you need to take into account collisions. You need to take into account uh, exchanges of momentum. Uh, and, and all that will induce um, uh, a different number of physical processes that if you want to really do in detail, uh, of course, uh, it's complicated. So let me show you again uh, this, uh, this, okay, this video so you can see uh, that is time, the redshift up there, that is time. And you see how these different components, dark matter and baryons, evolve. You can follow galaxies, you can follow halos, and how they interact with each other, how they merge to form larger systems. But in, in, those, um, in those type of interactions is where the galaxies, they, they suffer uh, all this, this, this type of uh, processes that uh, certainly can lead to their transformation and to their quenching, to, the, to, the, to, the, uh, to stopping their, their star formation. 
right? And, and that's something that we really need to understand. We don't fully understand all these details, how they happen, when they happen, where they happen. And that's sort of what has been uh, interesting me, and, and, and that's kind of like set up the, the context or the motivation for the work that I'm about to, to show you. We will let the, uh, this, okay, so it's stopped, right? Uh, those are from, from theory. Uh, from observations, we are seeing uh, indication, perhaps not uh, super strong evidence, perhaps it is it's very, very strong evidence, that there is something happening to galaxies far beyond the virial radius of clusters. Galaxies, uh, it looks like if you want to reproduce, right, the, uh, the fraction of a star forming galaxies in clusters as a function of cluster centric radius, right, if you want to reproduce that uh, and reproduce that trend out to the largest possible um, distances from the cluster center, uh, you're not a, you're not able to match the uh, star formation, uh, the fraction of the star forming galaxies in the field, very far away from these clusters, right? This is a work done by Chris Haynes, and uh, and is telling us, look, if you really wanna wanna do wanna wanna really um, reproduce what you see in clusters, uh, you need to drop if you wanna match. Uh, the fraction of the star forming galaxies at large cluster centric radii, you need to lower the fraction somehow of the star forming galaxies from the field, which means that something needs to be happening out here in terms of distance, right? Oops, this doesn't move very smoothly, but something needs to be happening out here. We're talking about in projection at least distances three or more times the viral radius of clusters. Something needs to be happening there to galaxies that is lowering the fraction of the star forming galaxies. And that's uh, an indication of pre-processing. But you can, that was observation, Ali. But theoretically, models, uh, these are models by, by Yannick Bahé, also uh, basically is telling the same picture, right? You have uh, different components, hot gas, cold gas, and the star formation. The field values are given by those uh, yellow, orange uh, lines, horizontal lines in the plots. A and you see the deviation uh, of the fraction of galaxies above a certain value for those, uh, for those components, how they deviate from the field values already at a large cluster centric radii, right? You have the distance from the center of the cluster on the horizontal axis, and you see how galaxies with lower stellar mass, they are more affected than galaxies with higher stellar masses. This is something that you would expect. More massive galaxies, they have stronger gravitational potential, so they are better able to resist this transforming processes. Instead, lower mass galaxies, they're, if you like, weaker in, in the sense that they have weaker poten uh, gravitational potentials and they're, um, they can be affected more by any uh, interaction with the, with the environment. So in order to understand that problem, uh, the there has been uh, an, a number of projects uh, that I've been involved with over the years. Here I'm just going to mention Clash VLT, Sparks G Class, and Go Green, the more recent Go Green, where we have been uh, building these samples of clusters at different redshifts uh, with the idea in mind of not only doing uh, other very interesting science. Uh, Clash VLT has done an extraordinary work at mapping the mass distribution of the clusters in, in Clash VLT. 
uh, to sort of make uh, a, a very detailed uh, strong lensing analysis or weak lensing analysis, particularly trying to observe galaxies that are in the background, that are magnified, and try to, to study the first galaxies using clusters as cosmic lenses, right? Not only that, but Clash VLT has also provided a lot of information on the galaxies that are found uh, as members in those, those clusters. Sparks G class, also with the same idea in mind, if you want to understand the evolution of galaxies and clusters, uh, Sparks G class ha uh, developed uh, different techniques to be able to find clusters at increasing redshift. And Go Green has used uh, Gemini, uh, Gemini North, Gemini South, to uh, uh, carry it out a um, very um, a systematic and comprehensive spectroscopic survey uh, to really uh, get spectra for as many galaxies as possible in clusters and, and groups at redshift about one. Clash VLT, it's kind of like an intermediate redshift. Sparse G class go green, they, they go out to high ratio. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few things uh, on, on this, this surveys. Uh, but always keep in mind that if you want to do evolution, you need to, uh, you need to understand what you are selecting and what you're comparing with, right? So for this, models are very important. Models that give you how the, the, um, the halo mass evolves in time because you want to compare apples with apples. So if you cannot compare uh, clusters that are very massive here at this epoch with the very massive clusters kind of at the same mass here at rigid zero, you need to follow, basically compare clusters that follow the expectations from models that gives you the growth of structures in the universe. So, for example, Clash, uh, and, and Clash VLT here, you we're going to have, uh, sorry, here you're going to have Clash and uh, G-Class, right, uh, which are the uh, G-Class is the basis for Go Green, Clash is the basis for Clash VLT, and you find them here in this plot, and you see how they follow, basically, the right trend to be compared even with clusters at redshift zero from other surveys, because you really want to have, uh, you want to be correct uh, when, when you compare these this objects. Uh, so, Clash VLT, uh, Clash VLT comes from Clash, which is, um, it's, a, it's a treasury program with, with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, that observed 25 massive clusters in the redshift uh, range of 0.2 and 0.9. And they have been observed with 16 filters from the UV to the near infrared. There's wonderful data there um, with the quality, obviously, of, of HST, right? Observations with, uh, with, with ACS and, and I think with VIC-3 too. Uh, but then a subset of them, 13 of them, were observed with the VLT. That's why it's called Clash VLT. Uh, they are in a, uh, a little bit na narrower redshift range, 0 0.2, 0 0.6. They were observed with VMOS, an instrument that no longer is, uh, is available, uh, where we were able to get thousands, uh, oops, thousands of uh, spectra and redshifts. Uh, so this has been uh, probably the most comprehensive uh, uh, observations on clusters at intermediate intermediate redshift intermediate to low maybe for some for people uh, working on uh, AGN at high redshift this even redshift one or two for clusters which is high redshift for clusters is low redshift for them but so that's also to say that it's important the context but uh, Sparks and G-Class, they focused on, okay, so we have this wonderful data sets at intermediate to intermediate redshifts. How can we actually push the envelope to systems that are at even higher redshift? Because we want to understand the evolution of this uh, since early epochs, 
since the 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 the, the, the epoch in the universe's history that saw the first uh, protoclusters or clusters uh, being starting to be assembled, right? So uh, I'm not going to go into the details here, but basically, uh, um, sparks and and, and G class they developed they combined two different uh, techniques. Sparks was using an optical filter, the Z band, with uh, the 3.6 micron uh, band in Spitzer to produce right uh, um, and uh, a way of identifying clusters at a redshift uh, nearly one and a little bit above but if you use then uh, two bands in a Spitzer the 3.6 and 4.5 mic micron bands then you can get rid of uh, a number of uh, contaminants at lower redshift and you can improve the detection of objects at a higher redshift because in the in the near infrared or in the in the infrared basically this is beyond the near infrared in the infrared you see that there is this monotonic trend right uh, between color with this with this color index and redshift so we used um, those techniques and we were able to confirm spectroscopically clusters of galaxies at redshift even 1.6 two clusters are redshift 1.6 so the, the the method actually works uh, yes like that perfect yeah good thank you yes so I hope our YouTube uh, viewers are listening correctly what I'm saying uh, and this is well I have to confess this is a little bit uh, outdated probably and uh, the number of those numbers that you see there are numbers of a spectroscopically confirmed galaxies in those clusters and some some of those clusters the numbers are probably now different and we've been adding um, we've been adding cluster members spectroscopically confirmed but this is to say that these objects are, are real and that we are understanding how to select them um, and from there we can actually do our spectroscopic follow-up uh, G class was the basis sparks G class were the basis for the go green survey so we have 21 galaxy clusters and groups between that uh, range in halo mass 10 between 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 15 solar masses at redshift between 0.8 and 1.5 so it's about 1.2 the 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 medium redshift for the sample and uh, we conducted spectroscopy uh, for galaxies with masses two times 10 to the 10 um, and photometry is completed down to even lower masses tend to the 9.5 solar masses uh, there's there that those are the sort of the, the publications if you want to go and, uh, and check for yourself uh, there is exp extensive spaced and ground-based multi-wavelength imaging right and ground-based spectroscopy available for all these clusters in, in total uh, they have more than 1700 galaxies spectroscopically confirmed and about 800 cluster members in total have been identified so it's been very successful and you can go to the uh, website uh, up here and then you can go uh, to the, the data release and extract catalogs and you can do uh, science with them This is the last part of the, the talk. I haven't been saying which is the first part, the second part, it's three parts. This is the third part. The first part was the introduction uh, until I started talking about the surveys. Now we finished the surveys. Now uh, I think I'm good with time. Uh, I'm gonna give you a very brief summary of some of the most, uh, mo uh, more, uh, most recent developments uh, on uh, sparse G class and go green, right? I don't have time to talk to you about uh, Clash VLT, which is would take me longer to, if I wanted to include that. But at least uh, Sparks G class, and I, and I'm, uh, this is a message that I want to try to 
to to give you because uh, we started uh, this is a paper published by Ryan Foltz back in 2018 some years now right but we 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 decided okay can we model right the the number counts and the fractions of galaxies in the color magnitude diagram of the Sparks G class clusters um, but separating them in star forming the galaxies in blue passive galaxies quiescent galaxies in uh, in red those that have uh, have been stopped forming stars the quenching the the idea of quenching and an intermediate population of of galaxies which are in the color magnitude diagram in what we usually call the green valley which are, is, are intermediate type of objects very interesting objects by the way uh, I don't have time to go into into details with this but basically what we try to do is to uh, develop a model very simple model even a toy model if you like where we uh, describe the process of quenching by uh, something like this so the galaxies start forming enters the cluster at a time zero it will keep forming stars for a, a time t sub d inside the cluster and then it quenches the star formation in a in this interval of time right uh, until they reach total quiescency in the cluster environment so with that model we try to match the observations which are the fraction of qui quiescent star forming and intermediate class of galaxies and with that model we can derive uh, a quenching time scale and we compare in this figure that quenching time scale derived for uh, clusters uh, here and, and, and here right with other works in the literature uh, and there is already a work showing how the dynamical time scale for quenching which is a, a time square time scale sorry uh, that is related to dynamical processes like for example wrapper ramp pressure stripping on anything that could dynamically affect the um, the uh, the interstellar medium for example of galaxies a and this model this is a work by uh, Sean McGee uh, shows this this evolution it's very easy to derive this the scaling relation right a and we see that the our data our our work right um, is consistent this delayed and rapid uh, quenching model right I is consistent with galaxies being qu quenched through dynamical processes that's the first thing that we notice then if we go to a class of objects very interesting class of objects that are called uh, post starburst galaxies they're probably probably that's not the right way of naming them post starburst because post starburst means intuitively that those are galaxies that were starburst and now they're not starburst anymore but it should be called post star forming because the starburst means that the star formation is strong right uh, hundreds of solar masses uh, per year for example instead star forming a galaxy can be star forming with a few uh, solar masses per year our galaxy forms about one solar mass per year right uh, but those galaxies uh, are interesting objects because they are defined uh, originally based on spectroscopy they have um, in their spectra features corresponding to a type stars which are uh, it's a relatively young stellar population uh, they have a, 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 a pseudo continuum in their spectra that is similar to a um, k-type star there are calcium lines as well 
and there are no emission features, which means that the galaxy is not forming stars, at least not at the epoch of observation. The fact that they do show this um, A-type star features, which are Balmer lines, absorption, hydrogen absorption features from the Balmer series uh, that comes from relatively young star populations, it means that those galaxies, they were forming a stars relatively recently, right? They stopped forming a stars within a couple of giga years from the epoch of observation. And when you select those galaxies, here selected not necessarily in spectroscopy, but also using photometric information, but you plot them here uh, as a function of stellar mass and effective radius. So basically the vertical axis is the size of the galaxy, the horizontal axis is the mass of the galaxy. Uh, and then you put them in the plot, in this plot, and then you plot here, right, the this um, mass size relation for star forming field galaxies at the redshifts of the the sparse G class clusters, which is about redshift one, right? And then you give that you, you get that relation here. And then you plot for field galaxies at redshift one, but now quiescent galaxies in the field, you put them in this diagram, you get this relation, this other line. These post-star burst galaxies are kind of right in between. And this could be interpreted, right, as a combination of outside in fading, right, from a star forming galaxies, right, and a size growth of quiescent galaxies for uh, from quenching and uh, and mergers, right? dry mergers, so there is no star formation uh, associated with those mergers. So if you have dry mergers, uh, minor mergers, the galaxies, they would increase a little bit uh, in, 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 in mass, but if the galaxies, they fade from the outside, they start kind of uh, quenching from the outside, they, they basically, the star, you, you see the, this, the light distribution actually, to be more concentrated and with smaller sizes. So this hints again, right, um, to that th this is kind of consistent with this picture that something is happening to the galaxies uh, in, th in the outer regions of them, in their envelopes, so that could be um, uh, an indication also of dynamical processes. Uh, using ALMA, for the uh, for some of the galaxies and, and the clusters are ratio 1.6, uh, also observed and identified with the Sparks G class, uh, we we have obtained this 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 really nice um, uh, velocity fields for those for some of those galaxies. These are just examples, but if you plot here the distance, can you see the well? If you plot here the distance of uh, of the basically of the galaxies in terms of a star formation rate in comparison with the star formation rate of uh, coeval field galaxies. These are those star forming galaxies in clusters and you compare the, 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 the star formation rate with the coeval field galaxies, the star forming galaxies, and you plot here in the horizontal axis the, the gas fraction of those galaxies, then you see that those cluster galaxies, they, they, they tend to have, uh, first of all, they, they, are, they resemble rotating disks, right? Uh, where's the, uh, uh, come down, come down. Okay, they resemble rotating disks, okay. And, but they also show higher fractions of gas, and we don't really understand that. I cannot give you any explanation because we don't really understand why those galaxies they they tend to have higher um, higher fractions of of gas and slightly smaller CO disks, uh, suggesting gas tripping and again consistent with this idea of dynamical processes happening already at those redshifts, which is kind of difficult to probably uh, understand at first, and because 
we know that at lower redshift, dynamical interactions are much easier when you have a more developed structure, a cluster with a more developed intercluster medium. At those higher redshifts, the intercluster medium is probably still in its infancy and it's been trying to be, I mean, still being, being developed. So if there are dynamical processes there, that, that is not clear. So this is something interesting that we need to keep focusing on and trying to understand better. But for now, this is an interesting result, but we don't, we don't, uh, we don't fully understand that. This is another way of, for this galaxy, so ratio 1.6, also observed with ALMA, this is more technical, but basically there is this there is two quantities here and on this plot, and both in the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. They are estimates for kinematic asymmetry. I don't have time to go into the details. Here's kind of like a brief description of what those quantities actually mean, but you can go to uh, this recent paper um, where where you can see the, the definition, but um, how are we doing with the microphone? There's something. Ah, thank you. Okay. Yes, I I missed that part that I had to also do something here. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, the important thing here in this plot is that here we have observations of galaxies in clusters are ratio 1.6 and those are the green symbols there and the orange ones are simulated field galaxies this is just to compare cluster versus field and those quantities in the vertical axis and, and on the horizontal axis they are a measure of kinematic asymmetry and kinematic asymmetry usually is the result of galaxy interactions. So the larger those numbers are, the larger the, the asymmetry. And here we see that cluster galaxies tend to be a little more asymmetric than field galaxies, suggesting again that the environment is doing uh, something to the galaxies. I'm reaching the end of sort of the the, the talk. Uh, this is something that this is kind of a very important part of the message of, of this talk. Um, and we didn't really fully understand at first this result, but then uh, we um, we came to the conclusion that it's very significant. Uh, Using the go green clusters, again, the medium redshift is about 1.2. Uh, if you separate galaxies, quiescent galaxies, and star forming galaxies, you separate them, and then you calculate the stellar mass function. And you do that for clusters and the field, right? Look at quiescent galaxies in clusters and feel the stellar mass function is the same. If you do that for star forming galaxies and you compare clusters versus field, it's the same. We were not really expecting that because what we know from the local universe is that there are differences. But if you calculate the quench fraction excess, which is a way of calculating the fraction of galaxies that in the field are star forming, but in the clusters are not. So in a way of, that's a way of quantifying how good is the environment to quench the star formation of galaxies. And if you want to match the the observed quench fractions in galaxies and groups from go green you need to have a, a quench fraction excess that is a function of a stellar mass so in a way you cannot separate 
environmental quenching from mass quenching, which is something different that we know occurs in the local universe. Right? There are several works that shows you that you can separate at low redshift environmental quenching and mass quenching. It seems, based on these observations, that at high redshift, you cannot do that. And this immediately uh, brings you to start thinking, okay, so how can we explain this, right? So one way is that obviously there is a different quenching mode operating at high redshift, different from what happens in the local universe. What could that be? Early mass quenching, overconsumption, which has to do with this dynamical uh, effects that uh, we're finding uh, uh, evidence for that the environment has a head start uh, in quenching the star formation of galaxies, which points to pre-processing. Pre-processing where? Before these clusters were fully fleshed, so maybe in protoclusters. This result came up again if you calculate the fraction uh, of star-forming galaxies in the field as a function of a stellar mass that are needed to be quenched to reproduce the mass functions that we observed. And then again, this fraction of star-forming galaxies in the field that need to be quenched is mass-dependent. More massive galaxies, they need to be quenched in larger numbers and obviously before than entering into the cluster, right? Uh, before it's about one giga year, right? If you want to explain the observation. So this highlights that, okay, pre-processing, what we observed in the local universe is also happening at high redshift. Uh, we need to pay attention to it. Where, I where does it happen? Uh, well, if these are clusters of redshift 1, we need to go at a higher redshift, and then we enter the realm of protoclusters of galaxies. Uh, this probably, because of the time, I should say very little or skip it. I have only two, more, two or three more slides left. But this is to show that we've been trying to model this uh, quench fraction excess with uh, simulations, state-of-the-art uh, cosmological hydrodynamical simulations, and we're still having problems. We don't, the, the simulations cannot really reproduce very well what the data uh, are telling us. And, and this is sort of the last that we've been, we've been doing. We've been trying to model this quenching time scale as a function of stellar mass. So we have a very simple model that actually reproduces right, the observation of the fraction of quenched galaxies in the clusters and in the groups of Go Green. Right? Uh, and when we do that at the redshift of the Go Green clusters here, we get the the uh, the um, the simple model gives us this quenching time scale as a function of a stellar mass that follows that line. Now I'm using the finger, <laughs> and you can compare that with uh, estimates of the depletion the 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 um, the depletion time scale for uh, um, for neutral and molecular hydrogen as a function of a stellar mass. And they sort of agree. But if you introduce pre-processing, this model becomes this curve, the red curve, which, is, which agrees a little bit better even with this, time de de this depletion time scale for the gas, right? So, this is again to tell that what we're finding is consistent with the fact that there has to be some kind of pre-processing, right? Um, and uh, and 
and we've been exploring a little more. It has to do also with the dynamical uh, processes, but uh, basically the uh, the uh, the quenching here in the clusters operates in the sense that the galaxy enters R200, right? But we've been trying to uh, basically uh, try to find solutions if there are different pathways for quenching within the clusters, and not only considering that the galaxy starts to be to become quenched when it enters uh, R200, the Vera radius, but let's see if we find other ways at different radii in the cluster environment that uh, basically that when when the quenching of the star formation starts and then we define this R quench as the cluster centric radius at which the quenching of the galaxies start but here we plot uh, the fraction of galaxies when they are finally quenched right uh, but we look at from which cluster centric radius they started to become quenched and we plot that as a function of that distance and we can see two different relatively different uh, pathways the one up here where galaxies they quenched closer to the cluster core most of them and then this other two pathways that galaxy where the galaxies actually become quenched at a larger cluster centric radius but within the cluster so those are two different uh, pathways for quenching one is called the core quenching which is the first one I, I mentioned the other one is called starvation right that's slower the galaxies they they take more time inside the cluster environment to quench right but only the starvation pathways are consistent right with the observations with the space space distribution and abundance of transition galaxies observed in the go green clusters so even though galaxies they can quench in, in different ways there is one preferred way for the galaxies right and this is this is something uh, interesting and, uh, and and all this is consistent obviously with this model where the the uh, the uh, time scale for quenching is dependent on stellar mass so again the mass quenching and the environment environmental quenching are not separable and that's the message i want to end the the presentation here uh because this is pointing to obviously action happening to galaxies in uh, in protoclusters of galaxies galaxies are becoming pre-processed pre in in protoclusters at a higher redshift that's something that we need to explore more it's difficult to work with protoclusters of galaxies right uh, it's difficult even to define correctly protoclusters of galaxies and even more difficult is to actually identify them observationally the galaxies that belong to to a protocluster right so, uh, or maybe it's not so easy to uh, maybe not so difficult to define them but it's very they are uh, it's difficult to really um, observe them right uh, but but this is just to say that now there is uh, now we're seeing the need obviously for if we want to really fully understand the quenching process of galaxies in the universe that is part of what what is what it's inside this the first plot I show you this this evolution of the star formation rate density of the universe as a function of cosmic time if we really want to understand that we really need to not only study clusters groups we also need to go to the early phases of cluster assembly uh, at the epoch where these protoclusters started to uh, first evolve, first develop, and try to identify which processes are actually operating them that can give this head start to the surrounding areas of these clusters so we can actually have these higher fractions of of star forming sorry of uh, quench galaxies and clusters are redshift one but also 
that uh, allow us to explain this mass dependency of the quenching that we are seeing. So I leave you with a summary, uh, and I thank you very much for your attention, and I will take some questions if there are. I think we're kind of just in time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great talk. So let's start with the questions. Hi, it's a very interesting Hi, talk. Thank you. Uh, my, my question uh, is regarding to your second slide uh, and uh, your last, uh, not uh, the summary, but this slide also. Okay. I, I w uh, not this one. The, the ah, the previous one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if the quenching uh, didn't start even before the protocluster uh, phase. Uh, I, I, I mention it because uh, what we are seeing with James Webb uh, results that indicate the presence of red galaxies at very large red shifts. Absolutely. Uh, this is one point. And the other point that's related to, the, to this question is how reliable is our knowledge of the star formation density at very high redshift in the rising part of the Madaus curve? Well, that's, uh, those are very two uh, very good questions. The first one, yes, I think maybe the quenching has to start even before this protoglaster starting to appear. And that's uncharted territory as far as I, uh, I understand. Uh, I might be wrong, but that we need to understand. What James Webb showed us is something that we don't really fully, fully understand how those galaxies uh, came about so quickly, right? Considering the, the estimates for their masses, we see even rotating disks already there. How do we, how do we get a massive galaxy to start rotating very quickly, right? If we are in a in an in a epoch where there is a lot of action and, and there, the, you expect the galaxies to start to be to be formed from something, some kind of uh, structure, proto-structure, proto right, that is not necessarily a disk. So James Webb is obviously challenging us and is showing that, look, I mean, pre-processing might, might not even be necessary to have uh, maybe higher density environments. Maybe the galaxies there is some kind of uh, a nature there at a very high risk that we need to we need to understand. We don't we don't really understand that. And how reliable are those measurements? Well, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I have the right answer, but um, I don't know if it's easy for me. I don't know if this is going to. Well, one of the reasons why I mentioned this uh, I made this question is because we know that. For example, there are many sub-millimeter galaxies exactly. uh, that we are seeing now, even in, uh, in the James Webb image. Yeah, that's that right. don't have an optical counterpart. That's right. So they, may, they might be missing in this. Of course. Part. I mean, this, this part, obviously, now with James Webb, ha ha has to be updated. And there, I think uncertainties are, are larger than what, what we have here, certainly. I mean, this is an relatively old plot. So really James Webb is it's it's uh, telling us that here I mean we, you really guys have to focus here and really fully understand what is happening in terms of mass assembly quenching and everything. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not I, I could not say more than that I guess. But but it's a very very interesting uh, subject, very interesting epoch and a very exciting times for us astronomers to <laughs> to have James Webb and and start digging into the, the real details there, right? Thank you. Thank you. Gastel. Hi, uh, Ricardo. Nice to see you here, <laughs> and uh, thanks for this nice talk. And Thank I you. Nice exactly to the you same too. question as uh, Laird, but I was thinking not really about the James Webb uh, observations, but about the simulations, because you showed uh, this last uh, picture of a simulation, and then the, the, there's another one that you showed the animation at the beginning, 
And in both, we see that there, there is already some uh, uh, over density in the place where a cluster will be formed. So uh, when you have this um, over density, even at the very high redshifts, uh, six or seven, uh, I was thinking, uh, does the, the, the question could start that early? Well, but you answered uh, later that maybe probably yes, because of this James Webb observations. But I, I'd like to point out that we see the, the over densities, not the protoclusters, or maybe the protoclusters at very high redshifts in simulations. So uh, if you want to comment on this. Well, I, again, I think I would say that uh, baryonic physics is complicated. And, and probably that's part of the, the problem, resolution problems in the simulations, so all that, that is uh, maybe we're missing some kind of key ingredient mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in the simulations at those early epochs, right, to try to really uh, explain the data. Um, I'm involved in uh, working with a student and another colleague on, uh, on uh, some protoclusters, a redshift about three, two, three, and in one of them we have one quenched galaxy, for example, only one, right? Um, so that's already inter interesting and we're, we're in the process of really trying to put this galaxy correctly into the context. Uh, and there you, it, since it's complicated, you need to see, okay, so we see one quenched galaxy, but then are there the other galaxies that are not quenched, how's their uh, star formation rate, how that compares as a function of distance, or if, you, if, you, if this quenched galaxy is located at the peak of the local mass density, do you see any gradient of star formation going out? Those kind of things, right, we, we could try to measure, but then in the simulations, it's uh, there is a lot of physics that is complicated. So I'm not a I'm not a uh, a person that does simulations. I'm an observer, so I'm not, I'm not the right person to 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 answer uh, why this the simulations are getting that wrong. But as uh, as an observer, uh, certainly I ha I have to say, look, I mean, it, it's we need to check the what is in the in the in the, in the modeling and the, the simulation, right? But it's again, it's a hard, it's the territory that is complicated. People are really trying to understand why the simulations don't really match the, the observations. Yeah. And uh, may I ask something else? Okay. Uh, you showed a model of Quentin that there, you showed, it's very sketchy, but the, the galaxy was falling to the cluster, then they had a delayed uh, quenching, and then a, a fast quenching. And I, yes, that one. And uh, I was wondering, uh, how do you compare the delayed uh, time with the, the quick uh, quenching? Because in my mind, I was thinking, well, when the, the galaxy starts falling to the cluster, run pressure uh, starts acting quite uh, quickly. The, the galaxy starts losing gas. And um, so I was thinking, well, the quenching uh, is almost immediately when the, the galaxy falls into the cluster. Well, I wouldn't be so sure about that because you really need to get into the higher density areas of the clusters to have the ramp pressure to operate as the ramp pressure goes proportional to the density. When you, when you are too far away from the, from the cluster center, you might not have much of an uh, intracluster medium to start affecting the galaxies immediately. So it's natural to think of a sort of a delay until the galaxy really reaches the the central areas that are denser and the galaxy also could actually s speed up because uh, ramp pressure also goes as the square of the velocity right so you need to increase your velocity your speed and also you need to enter this uh, higher density area so that could take some time it could be other processes outside of of the cluster uh, in the cluster environment. That's why, uh, and then then uh, uh, what what actually Claudia works on or has worked in the past, and then groups of galaxies, groups of galaxies, are probably the 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 environments where we have we really have to look at all these details, right? Clusters of galaxies that are so massive, galaxies they move so quickly, right? That even galaxy galaxy interactions last very shortly, 
right? They don't have much time to affect each other. In, in, instead, in groups, there are smaller structures. The potential, the gravitational potential there is not as strong as in clusters. Galaxies, they move slower. They're much closer to each other. So there is more time for interaction, for really disrupting the galaxies and accelerating this transformation. So, uh, right, I mean, that's, that's kind of what it comes to, to my mind to, to, to answer, comment your, your question, okay. but we could uh, continue on. Yeah, thank you. Know, you. Longer than thank you. Yeah. Ricardo, Claudia. Just a very quick comment. Uh, when you showed, I think it's the next slide, you showed some uh, velocity fields of a few galaxies. Oh, the next one. Uh, yes, the next uh, one, that so one. So you yeah. have many of those? Or you we have, have, we have uh, some. I cannot remember exactly the number. There are not many. Okay. But there are, there are, at least here you can, you can, you can count, uh, I guess, ah, the, the yes, points. Yes, so that's right, yeah. Yes. So what I was going to say is that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the compact groups is a very good place to have uh, interactions. And there, uh, the, the measurements of CO show that the it's very similar to galaxies in other environments. So right. There is no truncation of the CO halos. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's why this gas tripping, uh, I'm not sure, maybe because clusters are different environments, but uh, it's not the result of just galaxy galaxy interaction otherwise you would also see this truncation in a compact group exactly yeah. excellent comment claudia in fact we we don't know because for the reasons that you mentioned and and um, yeah we need to look at more into detail this uh uh this is something we don't we don't understand why they they, they have a higher fraction of gas and what is causing those discs to be truncated if at those redshifts, as I said, I mean, the intracluster medium yeah, is not very well yeah. developed. So there are not densities that are high enough to really produce enough ramp pressure that goes against this, this restoring force, gravitational force of the galaxies. Uh, yeah, we really don't, don't fully understand this. It was just a comment. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the very nice talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for having me. And I have a question, yes. uh, Ricardo. Please, uh, when you talk about uh, these dynamical effects, is just uh, this uh, run uh, pressure that strips matter and also interaction between uh, galaxies, or th are there more dynamic no, effects? No, mostly ramp pressure stripping. There, okay. are, there are interactions, obviously, uh, uh, between galaxies. Uh, interactions between galaxies and clusters, again, it's a little bit more more difficult to have mergers, especially at large cluster centric distances, because these galaxies are moving in radial orbits. They're kind of all falling. You could expect more mergers and interactions between galaxies in the, the central areas of clusters when they have probably passed already once through the cluster core, right? right. Uh, you could have uh, you could have this this uh, harassment, for example, right? Uh, just uh, very quick interactions as the galaxies are falling into into the cluster but it's mostly um a ramp pressure uh, ramp pressure right so th if it happens uh, especially in the center of the cluster I if this is more effective this is stripping of gas so we should expect also more metals in the center of the cluster gas well right. and the intercluster light as well for example the intercluster light i mean uh, those right. stars they they Some came gradient. from s somewhere right and then, then right. exactly, you have dynamical friction operating uh, better in the in the center of the cluster, so that will slow down your galaxies. Then you will have more time for galaxies to interact. When they interact, they can strip gas. To uh, one galaxy can strip gas to the other, and vice versa. And then you release this material into the intracluster medium, affecting your metallicity, the met metallicity of the ICM. But you also will inject stars into the cluster potential that you will actually build up, help to build up the intracluster light that we see. I mean, if you observe clusters with an op depth, you can see this uh, low surface brightness emission, optical emission, which comes from the stars that most likely have been extracted from galaxies through these different processes. Great.
So, so if this stripping of gas is the, the, uh, the main reason for the quenching, I'm not surprised that it doesn't come out from the cosmological simulations naturally, because as you said, uh, the resolution is not enough for the It's not enough. And, and it should, it should have been modeled to, to be put. It That's maybe right. That's right, yeah. Maybe with dedicated simulations. I, I think we had... Uh, maybe I'm not you a know simulation Rubens person, Ma but... Rubens Machado, I don't know if you know him. No? It's uh, <laughs> someone collaborator. Of okay, the so then which... Or yeah. institute. He works exa exactly... Uh, he showed uh, uh, this year uh, simulations studying uh, these stripping effects, these realm pressure effects. Maybe it can be combined with cosmological simulations. Uh, we should, we uh, should talk to him, yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Google Meet. Over there. Yeah. Can they see me? No. Ah, yes. There. there they see me. <laughs> hey. like, like here. That's better. Hi. Hey. Ah, yeah. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, loud and clear. Hi, Ricardo. Hello. So, um, I, I have a question with uh, regard to the, the, the field, uh, the field uh, objects and the cluster right, the objects in the cluster, that you have the star formation rate is larger in, in field systems uh, than in, in, in cluster systems, right? Um, isn't this uh, 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 kind of expected because uh, exactly, you might expect that the star formation rate is related to the quantity of mass and density and concentration in the system, right? So at, at scales, uh, at gala galaxy scales, you, you have uh, uh, exactly the same effect, right? The star formation, larger star formation rate is, uh, is related to a, a larger uh, feedback on, on the system, and then, right? Right, that so, is true, that is true. The star formation rate uh, scales with mass. So that's why actually when you really want to see if a galaxy is quenched you need to look exactly. at the specific star formation rate so you, mm -hmm. you need to get read somehow the mass because you know mm -hmm. that those quantities scale with each other right in this case you might expect that the quenching should be larger in, in, in cluster systems rather than in fields uh, right 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 that's those what you, exactly exactly and that's what in a way we observe but at least in Go Green, we're observing more than what the field can provide. So in fact, this is this is a detail. I was not expecting anybody to make any question. I'm not sure I can. Well, but the, this the fraction there. Uh, I don't know if you can see this plot. Uh, which one? Uh, of course, you can. You can re-enter your presentation. Okay. Right. Yeah, uh, this plot, for example, if you if you see the fraction, the fraction goes above one. I don't know if anybody noticed that. Nobody asked me anything. I was like, good, nobody's gonna ask. Now I'm uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm touching the point myself. But right, so the fact that it goes above one it means that uh, you need more. You need more galaxies than what they actually the field can provide in terms of galaxies that start forming in the field that they stop forming stars and enter the cluster, right? So that means the, the, the number, this fraction above one, means that you need to add more galaxies that will be quenched when they enter the cluster environment. Uh, yeah. And there you can have other processes that are not necessarily related to the cluster environment. I don't know mm -hmm. if that sort of answers the question or gives you a better idea but in some sense, in some sense uh, but you know when you talk about environment you have to take into account that uh, a cluster environment uh, does require the presence of more more mass and more interactions so we might expect this quenching of uh, this more efficient quenching of star formation uh, in, in, in inside these in 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 in, in clusters rather than in isolated systems in right that is correct field. yeah that is correct that is correct the thing is that a higher redshift we're seeing a little bit too much of that so there has mm. to be something additional and that is where this idea of pre-processing comes in it's not only the cluster environment it's not enough 
to explain the observations. We have a larger concentration, a larger density as well. And star formation rate is directly concentrated, uh, related to, to density, not only mass, but density, right? Uh, so, it, it, for instance, at, at galactic scales, if you increase the star formation rate, uh, if you have two star forming systems, and the one with the larger star formation rate is the one that allows for, you know, the feedback of this into the system in quenching um, the, uh, the aging outflow, for instance, is larger when you have a larger star formation rate. Right, yes. Yeah. Uh. yeah, no, but it, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that because at least here we're average, averaging out within the cluster environment. We cannot, the, the, it's true, right, that, that you have a, in a, in a higher density environment, you should have uh, more galaxies quench, but in clusters that happens more in the core than in the outskirts. And we were reaching out to our 200, which is already kind of the outskirts of clusters. So we cannot really tell exactly when that I where that is happening. What we're saying yeah. is that if you take into account the whole cluster population, you count all the galaxies that are not forming stars without the cluster, it's not enough to quench galaxies from the field. Right, so right. you need but to have other sources of quenching happening outside the cluster. But it's true what you say, that you expect correctly mm -hmm. that in clusters environments there should be more quenching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, well, at least at first um, approximation, as a first approximation, we might expect this one. That's but right. I do agree with you that the process, the overall process is highly nonlinear. So yeah. in, uh, you, you may expect some positive feedback or negative feedback. Both may you oh, of course, of course. On average, on of average you end up with this this kind of uh, effect that is actually what you are. Uh, Th that is that is correct. And here we're unable to see all this uh, negative positive feedbacks. We're just seeing the the overall effect of all this different. Uh, for example, we don't see AGN feedback. For example, right, right. we don't see that. We're, we're not able to disentangle at, the, at that level. That may right. result in a negative feedback. Not, what, yeah, right? that's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Th uh, thanks a lot. It, it, it's really an, an intriguing and interesting <laughs> point. I always try to make this correlation between, you know, larger, very large scales <laughs> and what happens in at smaller scales because the, the physical processes are essentially the same. Which, which, so is, which is important and we're trying to do, right? That's the, that's the mm -hmm. thing that we should do, yes. yes. Exactly. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank for you. the talk. Thank you. Very okay, we have a, a question here from YouTube that is in line with the discussion that you were having with Professor Lyarch, but maybe you can add something to okay, the discussion. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, Cristiano Brandon is saying, considering the capabilities of the James Webb Space Telescope, how will it enhance our understanding of the cosmic star forming region density, especially in regions or epochs previously inaccessible to other telescopes? Well, that's exactly what we are yeah. talking about you with with Laerte, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's basically the same comment, and it's something that, I mean, James Webb is just starting. So that's that's the thing. We can still, I guess, we cannot jump into conclusion just because if see just because we see a few already disk galaxies or or red galaxies, and because James Webb is going to be showing maybe even more objects like those and uh, those numbers will be will be changing uh, in, in, in a few years to come so yeah so okay so any other comments thank you very much let thanks thank again you. the speaker thank you very much thank you with uh, Richard we will stop the YouTube thank you and uh, we will have a coffee break here please we can continue the discussion.